Good morning, everyone. Before we start, I will read the personal meditation for everyone. Please follow along silently as I read aloud. So the real epiphany of, epiphany of Mark 8, 31 is not that Jesus' mission is to die, but that his faithfulness to God's healing mission will inevitably result in his death. In Mark, Jesus must die because his commitment to human healing will not fall. With two millennia of holy weeks under our belts, we can easily underestimate the power of this epiphany. Essentially, Mark is saying that the Son of God will not dial down his ministry to spare his own life or even to ease his suffering. His commitment to the healing of humanity literally knows no limits, and neither, Easter tells us, does God's life-giving power. Good morning to all of those that I see in church this morning, and as well as those who are on the Zoom platform. We really appreciate you being here, and I hope that you've had a good week, and you're going to have a better week even next week. Thank you for coming. If you're a guest here, please make that not known to me, and as well to our minister, and record your name in the narthex, if you would, please. We will do the introit together. Okay. Oh, you don't have music. Then we will skip right to our call to worship. Please follow. Let us turn our minds from human things. Jesus saves us. Let us set our minds on divine things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will deny ourselves and take up our cross. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will lose all that we may gain all. Our faith in Jesus saves us. And our first hymn is, He Leadeth Me. Please stand, if you will. Thank uh...
please be seated. Our call to confession. The story of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, affirms that God's love for us is endless. We see God's bond with humanity throughout the Old Testament, and we see even clearer how deep and broad God's love is for us in Christ. Being assured of God's love, we can come together to confess our sins to God and one another. And together, our unison prayer of confession, God of mercy, we send Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are enslaved by pride, but we see ourselves as great when we are small and powerful when we are weak. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored the truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. You return us the paths of righteousness. Jesus Christ, our Savior. been poured into all our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit, our guide, and our source of God's presence, connecting us to Christ. It's in Christ that you are made a brand new creation. Your old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And friends, being affirmed in our newness in Christ and our forgiveness in Christ, we can share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. So, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's give a nice little wave. And now for our special music, which I'm very excited for, especially because we don't have Linda. Don't get into it, buddy. <laughs> don't believe them, they sound great. I just gotta find my video here. Okay. Oops, down one. Ooh. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found was blind, but now. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first relieved. So Shining out. 
first begun. And now we'd like to do it one more time on the first verse only. And all of you who care to join us, please join in. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for Amazing Grace, one of Penny's and my favorite hymns. Thank you so much. The other thing, too, is what talent we've got in this church. And I hope over time, with our new minister, many of you will step up to be able to do the same thing, too. Maybe not sing, but do something special to be able to lead our congregation. Again, gentlemen, thank you. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Along with John 3.16, this is probably another favorite within our church environment. It lays the background for what is to come with our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 8, 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But returning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of our Lord. Please pray with me. <coughs> God, we thank you for this blessing of the time together. Guide our thoughts and guide our understanding of your message for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, this is a serious question up part of my sermon. My mic isn't on. Uh-oh. Oh, now it is. There we go. I'm sure that's much better. I know I have a resonant voice, but mics are very helpful. So sorry about that, everybody. So, now, now that that business has been taken care of, and my hunch was found correct, when it comes to writing sermons, the better ones often have some kind of story to share, right? 
At least there was I enjoy more. I don't really want a lecture on the Bible, but I hear a sermon. I want it to, I want the Bible to be shared in a new light. I don't want just a, just a lecture. So as I was preparing for this sermon, I found someone else's story that showcases a modern example of cross-bearing. So I'm going to share it with you. I'll be quoting him directly, but I'm changing it from the first person to the third person where it's appropriate, just so we all know. The quote starts now. The work of taking up the cross is the collective work of churches, not just individuals. The author, Robert Gensch, caught a glimpse of what that looks like while engaged in urban ministry in Baltimore in the 1990s, when an interfaith and multiracial community organizing coalition called BUILD, Baltimoreans United in Leadership Development, embarked on what came to be called the Living Wage Campaign. It began as they talked with low-income workers who were struggling to create a life on minimum wage. They knew some of them from soup kitchens housed in the churches they served because it was hard to pay the rent and have enough money for food. Yet Baltimore's downtown and inner harbor districts, which were developed in part on the promise of producing jobs for low-income residents of Baltimore, were thriving. So the churches of BUILD began to organize low-income workers to pressure the business community and the city government for living wage jobs. Resistance to their work was strong and swift. It made people angry and there were consequences. The business community, the mayor, and even some church folk pushed back against their efforts. At times it felt as if the whole city was against them. But as a collective, they persevered in the midst of backlash. And eventually, they lobbied for and, support, and helped support the Baltimore City Council's bill to raise the minimum wage of workers to a more livable standard. For him, the, that work on Baltimore's living wage campaign remains etched in his memory as an example of what it means as disciples of Jesus to take up the cross. It means to agitate, to name, and to resist suffering in our communities and world with eyes wide open to inevitable back backlash and painful consequences that may come our way. We take up such crosses together as a collective work for when some of us wane, others continue to bear them and to bear us along as we endeavor to follow in the footsteps of Jesus." End quote. Now, Robert Gensch, the man who wrote that story, is the current editor of the Presbyterian Outlook magazine. And as his role of editor, he sends out a weekly message about the lectionary reading for the following Sunday. His story broadened my understanding of what bearing your cross means. I had never thought of it in that way. Instead, bearing my cross has always been something I've wondered about. What does it mean? And why would Jesus demand this from his followers? Does he still demand it from us today? Our context is so different from the early followers of Jesus. How do we claim our metaphorical crosses to bear? I think to get really into these questions, we need to dig into the earlier verses of today's text. So let's read them again. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, 
Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So imagine you're Peter in this scene, okay? You just told your teacher, who you've given up your entire life to follow, that he's the Messiah. That happened a few verses before. The one who's going to rescue your people from the oppression of the Roman Empire. This is your understanding of Messiah, the person sent by God and appointed by God to break free, to overthrow the political pressure of another kingdom and reestablish the kingdom of David. You're thinking purely politically. You want this freedom from the Roman power more than almost anything. And you're proud to be part of this leader's inner group. Yes, he's gaining more and more followers, but you're one of the original, and you're in a special group he individually chooses to teach. You see how the Roman military forces and Roman pressure make life really hard for your fellow Jewish people. Heck, you know what it feels like from personal experience as a fisherman. It's hard to make a living on close to nothing while the Roman leaders and their appointed kings and governors have everything they want. You're bitter enough and desperate enough to follow this man who is charismatic and keeps talking about the future rule of God. He speaks so wisely and he does miracles he heals people. He seems to truly care about people, and not only people who can benefit him and his growing group of followers, but also those who can't. Jesus is the opposite of what the Roman leaders are, and you can picture yourself as one of his main appointed leaders once he overthrows the restrictive Roman government. It's happened before, and Jesus is going to do it again, and you're going to be right there by his side. But then, Jesus starts talking about getting killed, and about not winning this needed battle against the Romans. What was he thinking? He's not going to gain any support that he really needs if he keeps talking this way. Heck, he might even lose to the 12 of you. You're not so sure they're all committed as you are. So you speak up. You're always the one to speak up. And you do it again. You pull Jesus aside and you tell him, you got to stop. This is just bad press. Now isn't the time for this when things are so vital to gain support and traction for a successful overthrow of the oppressive rulers. You know the most important thing right now is to not push people away. Momentum is growing, and you know Jesus needs it to grow. Not say these ridiculously sad things, like claiming he's going to die before the overthrow happens. But when you speak directly to Jesus, he doesn't like it. You try to keep things calm by telling him one-on-one -on -one that he's sounding crazy and isn't using very good strategy to win over more followers and also to keep his closest disciples wanting to stay with him. So you're shocked at his response. He doesn't just rebuke you in private. He does in front of everybody. And he calls you Satan. How are you Satan? You haven't done anything wrong. You're trying to help Jesus remember the vision. Help him remember what is the point of this traveling around, teaching, and healing is for. It's to gain followers. As Jesus moves on, you don't. You stay caught up in his rebuke of you, wondering where all these things got mixed up and what went wrong. So friends, that's Peter, right? He wants a political leader. He wants a world change. What he doesn't realize is that Jesus is going to do so much more than that. 
much bigger than overthrowing the oppressive empire. Peter doesn't realize Jesus is going to change the entire way humanity interacts with God. And that with that change, for how, and with that change, comes a change to the way followers of Jesus truly follow him. We, as followers, will follow Jesus by serving other people without taking into account how others, especially those with any kind of power, will react. People could react positively or negatively. Either way, it doesn't stop our serving people in need, people who are marginalized. Now, what I want you to remember from this sermon today, friends, is that the suffering Christ wants from us is suffering that is caused by our discipleship. I know this sounds strange, but being a Christian doesn't mean having a simple, easy life. Jesus certainly didn't have that. Quoting Gensch again, he says, it is important that we be clear about the fact that what Jesus calls for self-denial and cross-bearing, suffering in general is not in view, but rather suffering that comes our way as a consequence of discipleship. Such suffering is encountered as a direct result of following Jesus, of embodying the reign and will of God which he bore witness to in our own lives, knowing that it may well evoke the world's enmity and backlash. Disciples are to have eyes wide open to this likelihood. We may suffer as a consequence of following Jesus. The kingdom of God is not the same as the world's governments and ways. This means there will be pushback from other people. Jesus started a countercultural revolution that still exists today, which is pretty amazing. We're testaments to the blossoming of Christianity. You're participating in this worship service today because the mission and promise of Christ can't be erased or silenced. God is always calling us and guiding us to find ways to follow Jesus better. Just as Robert Gensch shared in his story I told at the beginning of my sermon, following Christ in taking up our crosses doesn't mean suffering just for suffering's sake. It means coming together and being willing to suffer for the sake of other people because those people are worth it. Sharing their voices is worth it. Jesus Christ is our example in life, and we're called to follow him. That's why the ministry part of his story is so important for us to read and spend time in. We, as Christians in the United States, don't have to worry about prosecution and death for our beliefs. Other Christians around the world do, and the early Christians sure did. So taking up our crosses for us is a metaphorical statement. It means putting ourselves in potentially uncomfortable situations to share Christ's love with one another. This personally makes me of the political divide. There are people I love dearly who I don't agree with politically, but I don't let that stop me from being connected with them. I still show them Christ's love when we talk and connect. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe people you love are on the opposite or even just a different side of the spectrum. Our culture tells us that's bad. We demonize the other side, no matter what side you're on. But the truth is, that's not true. Yes, all of us are sinful. And I think all of us want the best, want what's best for our country and its future. I won't, I won't spend too much time on this. I promise it's almost over since politics are such a hot fun topic, but it's a very real reality we find ourselves in. And as Christ followers, I think it's important we see how unhelpful that political echo chamber is that lots of us find ourselves in today. 
So, so friends, just as Jesus rebuked Peter after Peter rebuked him for sharing the hard truth, we will face pushback for the ways we live out our faith that upset, upset the status quo. It might not be major pushback, but it could be some weird looks from other people. We're called to live out our faith by serving others, especially the oppressed, the lonely, the imprisoned, the homeless, and the poor. There are times when we fall into these categories too, which can make serving others even harder. In those times, continue to share Christ's love and kindness and know others are doing the same. Remember, as the opening story shared, the church works together to be cross bearers following Christ's lead. If you don't have the strength, one of your siblings in Christ is right there with you. So friends, live out your calling to follow Christ, knowing you're never alone. No matter how hard things get, God is with you and other believers are with you on this journey called discipleship and following Jesus. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Reverend Catherine. Let us all stand now for the affirmation of our faith through the traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, Born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified by the end of Mary. He descended into hell. The very day he rose again from the dead, he descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. Resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. Let's now openly share our joys and concerns in this church and as well on the Zoom platform, after which people will respond with God of mercy, hear our prayer. Let's start this time with those on the Zoom platform. Are there any joys and concerns wishing to be expressed? If anybody would like from Zoom to unmute themselves, they can do so now. Charlie. Okay, Donna, go ahead. Okay, uh, prayers for myself and for Bob this week. Uh, we both have some uh, medical problems. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That was Bob Gibson and Don Gibson, by the way. Thank you, Zoom platform folks. Thank you. How about our congregation physically in the church? Are there joys and concerns to share? Uh, Mike. I'd like, to, um, well, I'd like to thank everybody for refreshing my brother Frank. He made it through his prostate surgery uh, fairly well. We'll hear from him until this afternoon. But prayers for my um, son's fiance, Samantha. She's in Newton right now having appendicitis. So, and um, also, I see Frank Del Sardo was on Zoom, and I know we were praying for Frank and, and Frank Jr. last week, so it's good to see Frank on, the, on Zoom there. God of mercy, hear our prayer. I, I know that this probably is more an announcement than anything else, 
but in a way it's a joy. And that is, um, we've just been notified, I'm sure you all have been notified as well, that um, Presbytery has given us the opportunity of upping our attendance to 50% of capacity. So whatever that number is, and I do not know it, I should know it as clerk to session, but I don't know it. It's, it's what, if we have 20 here, it means simply 40 more uh, and et cetera. I think there's about 125 that uh, capacity at this point. I'm looking at Rich, uh, you know, for that confirmation. I do not know, uh, but nevertheless, we can increase the population here in church. So I think that's a very good thing. Thank you, Presbytery. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Others, Penny. Rich Oh, that's right, Rich. Jen is going to be undergoing some medical tests this week in preparation for surgery next week. So please keep Janet in your prayers uh, for positive uh, results from the test. That positive meaning good results for the test that she has this week in preparation for surgery next week. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, thank you, Penny, for directing me. joy is that Eric's sister and her husband are both recovering nicely from COVID. The God of mercy, hear our prayer. Others here in our church, joys and concerns. Thank you so much. Reverend Kathy. Friends, and just a little thing. I'm going to pray for us. And then the bulletin forgot or misplaced and I didn't catch it. Penny has a moment of permission. So after my prayer, we will stick you in, okay, Penny? Sounds great. So let's pray. Righteous God, you're our source of life, goodness, and strength. You inspire us with the power of your Holy Spirit. You feed our hungry souls with your holy scriptures. You fill a hole in our lives that can't be filled with anything else, even though we'll try. Listen to our communal prayers and empower us to live them out. Everlasting God, you created this world. You created all of us within it. Help us to see the beauty in all that is created by you and in your image. God, help us to set aside differences and see the, the truth of your amazing love and grace for us all. Help our leaders, oh God, at all levels to do the same. Beautiful Jesus, we call on your healing power to touch the people in our lives who need it. We especially pray for Donna and Bob and their health issues. God, help them feel better and help their doctors know what steps to take. We also pray, oh God, for Samantha, Mike's son's fiance, as she has a emergency surgery for appendicitis. We pray for Janet and her, the prep that she needs to take and the tests that need to happen for her surgery next week. May all those tests come back with a go ahead and help ease her fears. We also continue to pray for Heidi, oh God. We lift her into your arms. God, help us to help others as we can in this time and space. We also lift up in our hearts the names of people not shared and not known to us. For we know you know the hurting of your people. God of unending love, we also thank you for the many ways we've been blessed in the recent days, for the warmer weather, for the sunshine, and for the signs of spring coming. We thank you for birthdays and successful surgeries and recovery processes. We give you thanks especially for Frank making through his surgery. 
We thank you that Eric's sister Karen and her husband are both feeling well from COVID. We thank you that the presbytery has increased capacity for coming together in this space to worship you. Even as we know, our worship for you can happen anywhere. We thank you that we can come together to see each other's faces when we feel safe. Kind and merciful Lord, we pray for your church around the world, that we can do the work of your hands and feet for the people who need it most, and proclaiming the truth of the good news of the gospel, that you are a generous, loving, trustworthy, and saving God. Help us be bold in our faith, even if it means to suffer for what we believe. You, oh God, are expansive. Help us to be the same. As we leave worship here today, be with us in all our hard spots and our easy times. Prepare us to meet you with new eyes and ears on Easter morning in just a few weeks. With your goodness and love in the front of our minds, we pray now the prayer Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And we us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's a long walk when uh, everybody's sort of staring. <laughs> anyway, um, this minute permission is the first of five. For the next four weeks after this, we will be um, having a minute, a minute permission. Um, and on Easter Sunday, that is when the um, offering will be taken for that. The pandemic has stretched the church in many ways, but we are still very much here. Although it was surely hard at first, we have expanded our thinking and our doing in new and innovative ways to close the distance and to be together. We have continued to worship. We have continued to build and shape community. We have continued to take care of one another. And on top of all that, we have continued to come together to serve those in need, both here in our own community and all over the world through our participation in special offerings and in the spirit of shared mission. Despite the difficulty, struggle, and loss, the church continues to declare its presence in the world through different means, certainly, but toward the same purpose. One great hour of sharing is the largest way Presbyterians come together to do mission and ministry with those whom we see are in need. Through these gifts, we declare that the church belongs with people whom we see suffering from the terrors of howling winds and natural disasters, those from whom we see COVID-19 took futures and livelihoods and the whole culture threatened as a result. The church finds itself with those whom we see are thirsty because of too few water wells and with those who are thirsty because of a lack of political will and the failure of powers and principalities to act in order to secure safe water for everyone. The church belongs always and forever with those struggling for justice, righteousness, and peace. We give to one great hour of sharing because of where the church belongs, of who the church is. Please give generously to one great hour of sharing so that our church will continue to become, as Isaiah said, repairers of the breach alongside those experiencing great need. For when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Thank you.
thank you, Penny, for introducing the first minute permission for one great hour of sharing. So with this in mind, we turn now to our own time of tithes and offerings. We give as a joyous response to all the Lord has given us. We give of all aspects of our lives, our skills, our time, our love, and our money. Whatever you contribute to this congregation helps to further Christ's hands and feet in our communities. So respond to God with thanksgiving. Would you please join me in our unison prayer? Magnificent God, take all our offerings and use them for the continuation of your kingdom on this earth. We know you change the history of the world through the gifts of Jesus Christ, and we ask you to do the same with our humble gifts today and every day. In the power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now is our time to share opportunities to serve or any announcements the congregation might have. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share? I mm -hmm. As you know from last week, um, we have indicated that March the 7th will be a con congregational call uh, for the election of deacons and elders during that period of time. So on March the 7th, it's gonna be right after our church service. Please stay. It probably, in all likelihood, it will not last more than half an hour, hopefully just 15 minutes, but we need your attendance here. As you can see on the doors in back of you, we have announced this, we need to announce this so that the congregation sees this um, as being very important. Thank you. Congregational meeting, March, March 7th, right after church services. Thank you, Charlie. I also wanted to, um, last week we talked about the Presbytery getting a new name. That will be announced tomorrow. So next week, I can tell you what the name of our new, larger Presbytery is, because that officially starts Tomorrow, and that's when they're announcing the new name. It's all so exciting. <laughs> Are there any other announcements for today? Okay. Hearing none, we will continue to our closing hymn. Please sing.
to know that you should share Christ's love no matter what, for you are never alone. God is always with you, and so is the community of believers. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, everyone.